The longest, most grueling ultramarathon that the world had ever seen was well and truly underway. The runners were three hours into the week-long race. Professional runners from all over the world were leading the pack, and shuffling along far behind them was a strange 61-year-old Aussie potato farmer who'd never run an ultramarathon in his life. The media and spectators were all asking the same question. Why was this man even allowed to enter what was possibly the most dangerous and demanding race in the world? And they had even more questions the following morning when they woke up to find out that the old man was winning. A few weeks earlier in the small town of Beach Forest, Victoria, Cliff Young had stunned his neighbours by announcing his intention to enter the inaugural Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon. It was the first of its kind, an 875 kilometre, seven day long foot race, attracting the most hardcore marathon runners from around the world. The 61 year old potato farmer was an unlikely contender to say the least. Cliff lived a simple life on the family farm with his mum, tending to their crops and livestock. The sight of Cliff stumbling through the fields in his gumboots chasing after his flock of sheep had become a source of amusement for his neighbours. His running technique, more of a shuffle than a proper run, was quite odd and he certainly didn't strike his neighbours as a seasoned athlete. See, Cliff's family couldn't afford horses and tractors and for years he'd spent days and nights rounding up sheep on foot, often covering vast distances without rest. In Cliff's mind, the ultra marathon was just a longer version of chasing sheep. He figured if he could chase sheep around for two days straight wearing heavy gum boots, surely he could make it to Melbourne. When Cliff shared his plans to enter the race, he was met with a lot of scepticism. You must be joking. One neighbour scoffed. Have you seen yourself run? You look like you're about to keel over. Others shook their heads, convinced the old farmer had finally lost his marbles. But Cliff paid them no mind. He had a quiet confidence in his abilities. So while the town gossiped and joked about his chances, Cliff focused on preparing for the challenge ahead. When Cliff arrived in Sydney to register for the race, he couldn't help but feel like a fish out of water. The other competitors were all serious professional athletes, decked out in top-of-the-line gear and following strict training regimens. They'd come from all over the world to attempt this race, widely considered to be one of the most challenging, unforgiving and dangerous races in the world. As Cliff looked around, he saw runners carb-loading on pasta, hydrating with special electrolyte drinks and taking fancy supplements. Dedicated crews tended to their feet applying blister treatments and making sure their shoes were in perfect condition. It was all completely alien to Cliff, whose support team consisted of his brother Sid and a few other friends and family who would help along the way. And all they'd packed for sustenance were some vegetables from the farm, along with some water and the occasional cup of tea. In contrast to the high-tech gear of his competitors, Cliff wore a pair of old trousers with holes cut out for ventilation. On his feet were a pair of well-worn sneakers straight from the farm. This has got to be a joke. One run I muttered as Cliff stepped up to the starting line. That old guy will be lucky to make it 10 kilometers, let alone to Melbourne. Similar sentiments rippled through the assembled athletes and spectators. No one gave the unassuming potato farmer a chance. As the runners milled about the starting line, stretching and shaking out their limbs, professional runner Joe Record found himself next to Cliff. Intrigued, Joe struck up a conversation. So Cliff, what are you going to do with the prize money when you win? Joe said, somewhat tongue in cheek. Cliff turned to Joe, a puzzled expression on his face. Prize money? What's the prize money? Joe's eyebrows shot up. You know, 10 grand for winning the race. Don't tell me you didn't know about it. Cliff's eyes widened, a mixture of surprise and delight. $10,000? Crikey. I had no idea. That's a hell of a lot of potatoes. Joe chuckled, shaking his head. The idea of this old man even finishing the race seemed far-fetched, let alone winning it. But something about Cliff's enthusiasm was contagious. On a whim, Joe stuck out his hand. Tell you what, mate, let's make things interesting. If either of us wins this thing, we split the prize money. Deal? Cliff didn't hesitate, grasping Joe's hand with a firm shake. Your own son, make the best man win. As they lined up with the other runners, Joe couldn't suppress a smile. He doubted the old farmer would make it past the first day, but he had to admire his spirit. In a race full of ultra-competitive athletes, it was refreshing to meet someone who seemed to be in it for the sheer love of running. As the starting gun fired, the professional runners took off, 
quickly leaving Cliff in their dust. Cliff set off on his slow shuffle, his arms dangling at his side. To outside observers, it hardly looked like he was even running at all. The first day wore on and Cliff fell further and further behind. By dusk, the lead pack was already through the town of Mittagong, about 130 kilometers from the start. Cliff was still hours away. People along the route who had heard about the curious old farmer waited to cheer him on, amazed he was still in the race. As night fell, an exhausted Cliff finally staggered into Mittagong. The professionals were all tucked into their beds at the dedicated checkpoints, resting up for the next day. Their support crews were tending to strained muscles and blistered feet. Cliff stopped in for a bowl of soup and learned that the other runners had packed it in for the day. He was a little confused. See, Cliff didn't know that the accepted ultramarathon strategy was to run for the first 18 hours and then sleep for six. In his mind, you were supposed to just go continuously until you reach the finish. Never Nevertheless, trusting in the tried and tested tactics of the professionals, Cliff figured he should try and get some shut-eye too. He planned to sleep for no more than five hours. So Wally, one of Cliff's support crew, set his alarm for 5.30 a.m. and Cliff went to sleep. The alarm went off, Cliff woke up groggy but determined, and he hit the road again in the dark of the early morning. However, something felt a little strange. Cliff expected the light of dawn to hit him at any minute, but as he kept shuffling away, the darkness seemed to go on forever. The reason? Well, Wally's eyesight wasn't great, and he'd accidentally set the alarm for 2.30 a.m. instead of 5.30 a.m. It wasn't until Cliff had been shuffling along for a couple of hours that he realized the mistake. And by then, he'd already covered a significant distance and was surprised at how good he felt. So he decided then and there to forego sleep for the entire rest of the race. After all, if he could keep going without rest while chasing sheep, he could surely do the same in this ultra marathon. Cliff's unorthodox strategy began to pay off. While the other runners were still sound asleep, Cliff was steadily making his way towards the front of the pack. Sometime in the pre-dawn hours, the bleary-eyed professional runners began emerging from their rest stops to resume the race. And as they set off, a funny rumor began to spread up and down the pack like a bushfire. People were saying that the old farmer was in the lead. Runners scoffed and shook their heads in disbelief. It had to be a mistake. The old man must have hitched a ride or gotten lost. There's no way he could have kept running basically all night. But as the sun climbed and the kilometers continued to fall away, the impossible truth began to sink in. Through the dead of night, while the professional slept, Cliff Young had shuffled relentlessly on, snatching the lead. When the media found out what was happening, they swarmed. Spectators gathered along the route, all desperate for a glimpse of this unlikely hero with his pants flapping in the breeze. Well, they heard down in Melbourne that you were starting to stop. <laughs> Just to jump and that's better. Those trousers are pretty classy. Yeah, air conditioned. <laughs> The professionals redoubled their efforts, confident that the old man would crack sooner or later. Exhaustion and sleep deprivation would have to claim him eventually, as it did all runners in the end. It was simply a matter of time. However, as the second day passed and the locals came out in droves to see the crazy old man who seemingly didn't understand his own limits, Cliff continued pushing on through the second night, his lead only growing as the astonished professionals failed to reel him in. Why'd you go to the front so early? Uh, I liked the front position. I'd see I let them, the first day I let them run themselves out and then I took the lead at night time. And I've held the lead ever since. Cliff, for his part, remained utterly unfazed by the mounting excitement swirling around him. As far as he was concerned, he was just out for a long run in the outback of Australia. Same as always. Do you think that you can make it all the way? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm going to run all night tonight and I hope to finish tomorrow. However, as the race entered its final stages, Cliff Young's body began to show signs of fatigue. At one point, in his tired haze, Cliff tripped over a rock and he hurt himself badly. He was certain that he dislocated his shoulder, but he continued pushing on. His shuffling steps became more labored and his stops for rest grew more frequent. Despite his initial plan to just keep going, he, just like the other runners, had to stop for sleep. And the crowds along the route watched with concern, wondering if the old potato farmer had finally pushed himself too far. Joe Record, the professional runner that Cliff met at the starting line, had been trailing Cliff for days, and he sensed an opportunity. He increased his pace, determined to catch the old man. I think I can catch old Cliff, Joe told reporters confidently. He says he's a tortoise, but I think the old bastard is a hare in disguise. Joe believed that Cliff had overexerted himself too early in the race, and he would soon tire. He was sure that the farmer's lead was about to evaporate, that youth and professional training would ultimately triumph over age 
age and Cliff's unorthodox methods. Out of the two of them, I seem to have my money on Joe because uh, he's a strong guy and uh, Cliffy, uh, I think he's pushing himself too hard. Cliff heard whispers that Joe Record was closing in, that the professional runner was poised to overtake him at any moment. Cliff's head hung low, his body exhausted, but he willed himself to keep moving forward. With every step, Cliff's joints screamed in protest. His feet, blistered and swollen, felt like lead weights. He took out his false teeth and he tucked them away. The clicking against his gums was too much to bear. The old farmer was running on fumes. As he shuffled along, Cliff turned his head and he saw Joe Record coming up from behind him in the distance. The younger runner seemed to be getting closer with every passing minute. Panic gripped Cliff's heart. His improbable lead was finally about to evaporate. But just when it seemed that Cliff's body would betray him, he looked up and he saw the finish line in the distance ahead. The most remarkable sight in Melbourne this evening as Cliff Young comes into the finish line of the Sydney to Melbourne Ultra Marathon. Crowds line the streets to welcome the man who, over the past few days, has quickly become an Australian hero. The roar of the crowd in Melbourne filled his ears, urging him onward. With a final surge of adrenaline, Cliff focused his eyes forward and he kept shuffling. As he crossed the finish line victorious, Cliff turned to look behind him, expecting to see Joe Record mere steps away. But there was no one there. Cliff's exhausted mind had been playing tricks on him. In reality, Joe Record was nowhere near Cliff. None of the other runners were. Cliff had not only won the race, but the nearest professional in second place, George Purden, was more than 10 hours behind Cliff. Siggy Bauer came in third, and a while after, Joe Record eventually crossed the finish line too. Cliff Young had not only endured, but he had triumphed in spectacular fashion. His time of five days, 15 hours and four minutes shattered the previous record for the same distance by two days. Cliff had done the unthinkable, beating professional athletes at their own game through his own technique, sheer grit and refusal to quit. Now, you might be wondering what happened with the prize money. Well, Cliff did win the $10,000 and immediately after he cashed the check and as he heard word of all the other runners coming into the finish line, he did what only Cliff Young would do. Without hesitation, Cliff walked up to each runner and started pushing wads of cash into their hands. He ended up giving the other runners who finished $2,000 each. But of course, by the time Joe Record crossed the finish line, Cliff remembered the pact that he'd made with him at the start of the race. And he said, sorry, sorry mate, I got a bit carried away giving away all the money, but I haven't forgotten about our deal. And he gave Joe the last wad of $3,000. Ever since Cliff's incredible win in 1983, Cliff's running style has been studied and his shuffling technique, which is now known as the Young Shuffle, has been used by ultra marathon runners all over the world. As it turns out, a loose shuffle that uses very little energy and can be maintained for long stretches happens to be a pretty great technique for endurance races.